Good afternoon, my name is Aoife. Um, I'm here for um, the next hour or so to um, help you understand the BA uh, to Texas calculator. Um, so this is what you need to be um, very clear on how to use for your CFA exam. Um, the workshop is not going to go through in any great detail the um, technical side of the subject matter itself. So it does sort of assume that, you know, when I mention an annuity um, or a, an effective interest rate, that, that you're happy with these terms. So um, if that's not the case, it, it might be worthwhile going over the, the subject matter um, and then coming back um, to look at the, the workshop online. Um, however, I will obviously go into those topics in a, a, a little bit of uh, depth. Um, so it's mainly about the, the calculator and again, we're not going to have time to go through absolutely everything um, on the um, little calculator, but it'll be the core um, functions that are really useful and that will probably get used the most in the actual CFA exam itself. Okay, so um, first of all, let's just think about setting the calculator up and making sure it's in the right mode ready to go for your exam. Please be aware that if you do need to change the battery on your calculator, um, I've never actually ever had to do that, but let's say you did, it does reset itself. Um, so I was reading on an analyst forum recently and then the, the exams have just happened that someone did actually change the battery on their calculator went into their exam without realizing that everything had defaulted to the original settings so if you do you know drop it or it needs to be reset or the battery gets changed you will have to set it up again okay so setting up the calculator um, the first thing to think about is the number of decimal places that you would like your calculator to work to um, the CFA Institute say that they work their numbers to five decimal places. Um, so it, it's useful to set your calculator up to that. The only problem in doing that is if your answer to whatever calculation you've done happens to come out at five, um, so literally just five as a, as a number, if you set your calculator to five decimal places, then it will read uh, like uh, that basically. Um, so the numbers can get quite big. You're always looking at decimal places, even if you don't need them, lots of noughts, etc. Um, so what can be useful actually is if you just set your calculator to the relevant number of decimal places given the question that you're doing. Um, so for example, if the answer is um, 0.5, it just reads as 0.5, not 0.50000. If the answer is 10, it just reads as 10. If the answer is 0.67329211, it will read as that. And, and that's normally how I like to have the calculator. But I'll show you how to do the five decimal places and I'll show you how to do the other way also. So um, turn your calculator on. I've got the on button um, there. And what you have below, uh, above rather, the decimal point button, it, in yellow writing, it says format. Um, and that's what we need to get into. Um, the yellow writing above each key is accessed by the shift button. So if we do shift format, um, the first thing that could, should come up is DEC, which stands for decimal. Um, if that's not the case, then if you just use your scroll arrows to scroll around up and down, what you should get, what you want to be on, is DEC. So just scroll up and down. Um, you might have AOS, CHN, US. Just get yourself to DEC. Um, then you want to punch in the, the relevant number. So if you want it to five decimal places, you need to do five and then enter. And it should be in five decimal places. So if you now cancel out and you do um, five divided by 10, um, you can see you get 0.50000, so it's always working to five decimal places. If, on the other hand, you would just want it to say 0.5 for and not bother with the zeros, you need to set it to nine instead. So if you go back into your format, so second form, uh, decimal point, so second decimal point, um, get back to your DEC by scrolling up and down, put nine enter, and then close out. If you now do 5 divided by 10, um, you just get 0.5. If you do uh, 16 divided by 
50 or 63, um, you get a big long number um, on your calculator screen. So it, it, it will work to the number of decimals that are relevant. Um, having done all of the CFA exams myself, um, it's an incredibly fair exam and the numbers or options that you're given in A, B and C, I don't think have ever really been, in my experience, close enough together such that you would make a mistake through rounding. Um, so, you know, even if you weren't working exactly to five decimal places all the time, you're going to get the same answer or near enough to the same answer. And actually, what sometimes happens in the exam is they might say, you know, which of the answers, you know, is nearest to you know, the, the present value of a bond. So actually, if you work it out properly, the actual answer isn't there and they're asking you to pick the nearest one to it. Again, probably to get round uh, things like rounding errors. So whichever you prefer, the CFA works to five. I prefer to, to use this nine function where you get the, uh, the decimal places that are relevant at a particular time. Okay, so just have a, a mess about with that and make sure you're comfortable being in the right number of decimal places. Okay, so having had that done, um, the next thing we're going to consider is the mathematical precedent. If you have set this up already, if you've been on a course or something, it's probably been done for you. Um, if this is the first time you've opened your calculator, um, it will probably be on something called CHN mode. So again, if we go into format, so um, the, the second decimal point, so here's your second key, here's your decimal point to get you into the format. And if you scroll through, you will come to either CHN, which is chain mode, or AOS, um, algebraic operating system. One of those will, will be um, in your calculator. Now, the one that you want is algebraic operating system. So if you are in chain mode, CHN, if you go to um, that point, the way that you switch between different um, systems is the second button and then the enter button. And you can see above the enter it says set, so it will change the setting of the calculator. So if you just do second enter, it should come up with AOS. If you do second enter again, it flicks back to um, chain mode. And if you just keep doing second enter, you just flick back and forth between them. The one you want to be in is algebraic operating system. What this means is that when you punch um, calculations into your calculator, the system will prioritize um, powers and routing um, before multiplication and division, which will be before adding and subtraction. So it, it means that you don't have to mess around with brackets and so on as much as you would otherwise have to do. If it's in chain mode, the calculator will literally do it in sort of chronological order, if you like. So five plus one times three, it will do it as, as it sees it in a chain, um, which will give you the wrong answer in the exam. So make sure it is AOS. When you switch off your calculator, these modes will stay um, set. So your decimals will stay set, your AOS mode will stay set, etc. It's only if you take out the battery or there's a reboot or anything that you would need to set it up again. Okay, um, the other thing that you need to make sure is that the number of payments per year is set to uh, one. Now we will obviously, or you will, um, when you move through your studies, you'll come across semi-annual and quarterly payments of coupons, etc. Um, that's fine. This still needs to be set at one. Um, so, you know, once you've set this up, you can then go ahead and do your quarterlies and, and so on payments, uh, semi-annual payments, as the tutor tells you to, or as the books tells you to, but this needs to be set as one, um, which is slightly um, unintuitive. But nonetheless, um, if you go into um, second, just rub some of this out. So we're going into um, second, and then there's an IY button, which is, represents an interest button, um, interest payments per year, and we'll, we'll see um, that coming up as we go through the slides. So the um, second IY, um, my calculator is already set up to one. Um, if it's reading anything else, then basically just put one and enter uh, and, and then it will be set for you. Um, the other thing to, to be aware of is, is clearing 
Um, to, if you use the time value of money buttons, and there's quite a, a lot of present value calculations or annuities that you might need to calculate in the exam, um, then you need to ensure that you have cleared the time value of money information first. Now, as far as your calculator is concerned, these four, five rather, um, boxes here, oops, cancelled out. Um, so those five um, boxes or buttons, um, they represent your time value of money. So N is the number of periods in your investment horizon. Um, IY is the period rate. Present value is the value of the investment now to, in today's terms. Payments are any cash flows in or out over time. And then the future value is the value at the end of your investment horizon. You'll be using these a lot and the data is stored inside. So if you come back to use it again, the data from your previous example will still be there. So at the beginning of any time value of money calculation, it's essential that you clear those keys. And the way you do that is you push second FE. And if you look at the yellow writing above FE, it says clear time value. And that will empty everything to zero and then you're ready to go. Um, in addition to the time value of money buttons, there are also other um, questions that require you to enter into information into your calculator. So you might be using, for example, um, the depreciation button, which is that one. We'll look at how to do that. Um, you could be looking at the ICOMV button, which get you to um, think about going from a nominal to an effective interest rate. Um, we could be looking at net present value calculations and therefore needing to enter cash flows, etc. If you need to clear any of these buttons, then all you need to do is push um, second CE. So second CE, and if you can see above the CE in yellow, it says clear work. So specifically for those time value of money buttons, you've got to do second FE. But for any other data stored, for any other function, the way that you would clear that is second CE. It's all a little bit um, overwhelming initially at first, but once you actually get practicing questions, and there are an awful lot of questions to practice, um, this really probably is the best calculator in the world. So um, you will get very used to it. OK, um, in addition to that, just a couple of other um, areas that might be quite useful. Um, you have got a back button. So that one there. So if you enter in a figure wrongly or you want to divide and you put multiply by mistake, you can go back and it will delete what, what you've done. So you can don't have to enter everything again, which is quite useful. Um, if you do want to um, use brackets as you're building up your equations, then you've got the bracket buttons. Um, so again, that's quite useful. Um, you have uh, an nth power button. So um, you can raise things to certain powers. So for example, if we just work through that one, if you want to do 4 squared, now I know there is a, um, a squared button next to it, but you're probably not going to be doing 4 squared. You're going to be doing 4 to the power 16 or something. So let's just, for simplicity, do 4 squared. Um, if you enter 4 on your calculator, um, and then you push this X to the power Y button. Nothing comes up on the screen, but it's still pushed. And then you push 2. And then equals, you get 16. So again, just, just try that again. So 4, Y to the power X, 2 equals, and you get 16. What is missing from your calculator is a um, nth root. You've obviously got the uh, square root here, but what if you want to take the fourth root or whatever it might be? Um, to do that, what you have to do is, again, use the nth power button, but you're using fractions. So if you wanted to do the square root of 16, that's effectively 16 to the power 0.5. It's, it's, it's to the power one half. Um, so what we can do is use our nth power button where our power is 0.5. So let's try that. Um, 16 in the calculator. We're then going to use this nth power button. So y to the power x. And then type in 0.5 equals and you get back to your 4.
So, you know, if you're doing squares or square roots, yes, you've got a specific button for that. But if you're doing, you know, to the power 16, the power 50, um, or you're doing the, you know, the 10th root or the 5th root, um, then you have to use this y to the power x button. And if you're rooting, then it's 1 over. So the 4th root, 1 over 4. The 10th root, 1 over 10. The squared root, 1 over 2. Okay, um, also useful are the memory buttons. So if we just move on to the next um, topic. Um, the memory functions are really good because obviously in the CFA exam, you can be doing some pretty cop uh, cal uh, sorry, complicated calculations, which will require you to maybe do them piecemeal. If you want to save a particular um, amount that you've, you've calculated previously, then you can use these memory functions. Okay, so if we, you do, 2 plus 3.5, obviously that equals 5.5. To store that, um, what you need to do is press store 1. Now, if I just go back to the calculator, um, store 1, the store button is there. So you're just saying that 5.5 that's in your calculator, push store. And then you can put it into any of the keys. So 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, or 9. Um, they will store data in that particular button. So let's put it in button 1. So it's in button 1. Clear out. So that 5.5 is gone. What we now need to do is to recall it. So underneath the store button, you have a recall button. So let's simply push recall. And we want to recall what is in key 1. So you push that and your 5.5 comes back. So you've got your store button above and your recall button below. And then the sort of light gray keys or numbers 0 to 9, um, you can store data in there. I, I can't imagine you'd have data stored in all of them in the exam. Usually you're just using one key um, at a time. Okay. Right, so let's think about um, working between nominal and effective interest rates. Okay, the nominal uh, rate will be the quoted or the stated annual rate. Um, and that will not take into account compounding. Um, therefore, the effective interest rate will give you a annual rate that does take into account the compounding issues. So if we have a look at an example, um, here you've got 6% paid six monthly. Um, that 6% is assumed to be per annum, and that is the nominal rate. However, you have got compounding every six months, so two compounding periods in the year. Therefore, every six months, your period rate is 4%. If it's 8% per year, that is 4% every six months. Now, your effective interest rate formula would therefore say, if we look at this formula down here, the effective rate is going to be 1 plus the period rate. The period rate is just the 8 divided by the 2. So the 8 there was the annual, and we've got two periods in the year. So 4% is our period rate. And then there are two periods in the year, minus the 1. And that will give us, as a percentage, 8.16%. Um, if we then do this for the second situation where the interest is compounded quarterly, then the period rate is uh, 2, which effectively is the 8% divided by the four quarters, so 2% each quarter. That will compa compound four times in the year, and therefore you will get your effective rate as a percentage of 8.243. Now, that's great. Um, and actually, I, I think it's quite important for CFA um, to understand 
what's happening here because this is compounding, it's thinking about effective rates, uh, going back to nominals. It comes up in quite a few different areas, the skill of compounding. So I do think it's something that you need to understand. However, um, it is fortunately something that you can do in your calculator as well. Okay, so um, let's use the uh, first one, for example, and then we'll do the second one. So next slide. Um, you can calculate the effective rates from nominal um, using the calculator. So we're going to do that by going into the iConv button. If I just find a calculator picture. Okay, so what we want to do is to look at button two. You can see it says iConv, interest rate conversion, um, in that button. So we want to do shift two to get us into our function. So using your calculator, um, shift two. Um, if there's any information stored in there, you want to do shift CE just to clear it. Okay, it comes up with nominal. We want nominal to be eight, so enter. Scroll up and it gives you the uh, CY, the compounding periods in the year. Um, you want that to be two, enter. Um, and then if you scroll up again, you get to the effective rate, which you then want to compute. And if you compute that, it gives you 8.16. Um, again, just hopefully to be clear, the compute button is at the top of your calculator there. Okay. So you go into um, second, two. Enter the nominal as eight, scroll up, enter the compounding period as two because it's six monthly, scroll up again, and then to calculate the effective, you push compute. Okay, could you have a go um, at doing the second one where it was still the 8%, but now the interest is paid quarterly? Could you have a go at working that through? Okay, and you do indeed get the 8.243%. Um, you can go back in and do it all again and clear everything out. Um, but actually, you know, if you've got follow-on questions that use similar data, which you might do for level two or level three, um, then you could um, leave the nominal because it's already in there at 8%. All you've got to do is go and change the CY to four and then go back up to the um, effective rate and then just recompute it. So you're just changing um, that number Oops, sorry, that should be a four rather, beg your pardon. I'm just changing that number into a four. Okay. Right, okay, so let's have a look at the present value functions now. So um, present value functions, really key for the exam, um, these middle buttons here. Now, what this will do is enable you to work between a present value and a future value to solve annuities and to work out um, the effective uh, or the interest rate Im implied in the particular contract. Um, so let's just think about the example. So £2,000 for five years at a compound interest rate of 4%. And what they're asking you to do here is to compute the future value. So if you put $2,000 into a bank now and leave it in there for five years, assuming that the compounding is just annually because it doesn't say anything else and your rate is 4%, what would you have at the end of that period? So as far as the uh, data is concerned, all we're going to do is put five for the number of years. Um, the interest is four, so you actually enter it as a percentage, not a decimal. The present value is 2,000. The payment button is if there is any income or payments in during the life. In this case, there's nothing, so you can just ignore that one. And then you want to compute fair value. So to do that on your calculator, first of all, always clear your time value of money buttons. So second FE. Then we're going to do 5N. So you don't need to enter these ones as such. So 5N, and it's in. You then do 4, 
IY, and that's in. 2000 PV, and then you want to compute the future value, or future value compute. So 5 is N, 4 is IY, present value is 2000, and then compute the future value, and you should get $2,433. Now, it will give you a negative sign. Um, that just is due to the polarity of the calculator. Effectively, what they're saying is, if you put that in to your bank account or your fund, whatever it might be, this is the value that you will get out at the end. And that's the only reason the sign is negative. In the exam, if they were asking you to work out the future value, you'd ignore that negative sign. You'd just write 2,433. OK, let's have a look at another example. In this situation, they're asking us to compute the yield. So to do that, let's look at the data. We've got 5,000 today. So that's 5,000. It grows to $5,798.47 in the future. Now, we need to be careful. If we put that into our fund, we're saying this is the number we get out at the end. So this needs to be negative. Um, it doesn't matter whether the 5,000 is negative or the future value is negative, but the, the present value and future value must be opposite signs. There's no payment, so that can be ignored. And the number of years are three, but you've got semi-annual interests, and therefore the number of periods in the three-year investment horizon is six. Um, two periods each year and then three years. So that's going to be six. So um, again, clear out your time value of money. So second FV. Um, six N. Five thousand. Present value. Five thousand seven hundred ninety-eight point four seven and a minus. There's a minus key just down there to use. That's the future value, and then compute the IY. And you end up with 2.5%. Now, another thing just to be aware of there, um, that is a period rate, and so that will reflect the interest that is semi-annual. Um, so in the exam, if they wanted you to annualize it, they would need to tell you whether you are annualizing it on a simple basis, so for a year you would just double it, or whether you were compounding it and having to use the effective rate instead, which you could then do on your calculator, where this is the nominal, and then you just work out the effective. Okay, let's think about annuities and the future value of an annuity. Um, this is an ordinary annuity, and so for an ordinary annuity, we assume that the payments... are at the end of each period, which is the usual or the norm for the exam. OK, so they're asking us here to compute the future value um, of an annuity. So what they're saying here is if you invest £5,000 every year, and an annuity is a um, regular cash flow, equal period and the same amount going through. So you're investing £5,000 each year for five years. How much would you have at the end of your investment period? So in this case, three are the number of years we're investing for. The interest rate is 5%. The present value is irrelevant. There isn't a present value. We're, we're investing £5,000 each year for three years. What's it worth at the end? Um, and the payment or the annuity itself, 5000 so if we do this on the calculator, uh, again, clear out your time value of money button, so uh, second FV. Three is N. Five is IY. 5,000 is the payment, and then compute the future value, and you get minus 15,000. 762. Now again, you've got the polarity of the calculator. That 5,000 annuity is money going into your fund. That future value is what it's worth at the end coming out. Okay. Right, let's have a look at annuities in a slightly different context. Again, here we have an ordinary annuity, so the payments are at the end. Um, but the example here wants us to work out the present value. 
Now, that's like saying, let's assume that rather than the last example where we were putting money into a fund, let's assume that we actually need the money in the future. So we need £5,000 every year for the next three years at the end, maybe to finance university fees, whatever it might be. What they're asking you is how much would you have to pay a bank today in order for them to pay out that £5,000 regularly for three years, um, assuming 5% interest rates. So they're asking you for the cost of an annuity. So in this situation, again, we've got a three-year annuity, so N is three. Um, the interest rate is 5%. The payments are 5000 and the future value here is irrelevant. So if we want to receive £5,000 each year for the next three years, what would we have to give someone today for them to make those payments to us? So again, on your calculator, clear out the time value of money buttons. So second FE. Then you've got three is N. Five is IY. 5,000 is the payment. And we want to compute the present value. And we get minus... 13,616 or thereabouts. Now again, you've got opposite signs because what we're saying is we are going to be receiving that 5,000 each year. So that's money coming to us out of the bank, but that's what we have to put in to get it. So again, it doesn't matter whether you're thinking the 5,000 is an in and the 13,000 is an out, um, but they must be opposite signs. Right, last thing that I want to go through on um, these present value functions is to consider um, if they tell you that the first payment is received now. So the payments are at the beginning of each year. This is called an annuity due, as opposed to an ordinary annuity, which assumes the payments are at the end of the year. Now, basically, everything is the same. You just have to tell your calculator that the payments are at the beginning. And where you've got... Um, four payments, so you've got four payments, it will always calculate the future value at that fourth period, the end of the fourth period. So whether or not the annuity is an ordinary annuity where payments are at the end or whether the annuity is an annuity due where payments are at the beginning, when you work out the future value, it in both situations it's always at that T4 point. So it's always going to be at that point in time. So people often make the mistake of assuming that if your payments are in advance, um, you're coming one year forward in terms of what the calculator gives you, you're not. Both will calculate the position at T4. So we need to tell our calculator to get into uh, something called begin mode because the payments or receipts are at the beginning of the year. Now going back to a calculator so I can show you where this is. Here we are. Um, if you look above payment, in yellow it says begin. So we want to uh, go into shift payment. Now that should say end. If, remember, if you want to scroll between different modes, you do shift enter. So shift enter would get you to begin. Shift enter would get you back to end. Shift enter back to begin and you can just flick between them. Um, we want to be in begin mode. And if it is in begin mode, you, you, you should see BGN at the top of your screen. Okay, so here we go. Right, so we've got a four-year annuity, four payments. The interest is 6%. The payment is £1,000 at the beginning of each year. We're not bothered about what it's worth in the future. We want to work out what we'd have to invest today. So let's say we want £1,000 to be paid out to us every year for the next four years, but at the beginning of each year, what would we have to give a bank today to, for them to, to make those payments to us? So we're in begin mode already. Four is N. Six is IY. 1000 is the payment. And then you compute the present value, which comes out at... Minus three, six, seven, three. Again, this is something that we are receiving coming out towards us. That is a cost that we've got to put in. So you've got the opposite signs. Okay. And that present value obviously is here. But in a calculation, if you had to work out the future value, if you did need to work out that one, it is giving you the future value at that final point, the end of the last year. Even if you're in begin mode, it's giving you the point, the, the value at that date.
Okay, one thing that's quite crucial as well, um, in the exam you might be doing one calculation in begin mode, maybe two. Um, most of them will be in end mode. So the last thing that you need to do is forget that you're in begin mode. So always get into the habit, wherever you finish doing an annuity due, you go back and you change it into end mode. So to do that, second payment. which was here, so second payment. And then you want second enter to scroll between begin and end mode. So put yourself in end mode and then come back out. Good. Okay, um, the exam may require you to uh, do NPV calculations, so net present value calculations, and internal rate of return calculations. And this is sort of the last thing we are going to look at, um, in addition to standard deviations as well. OK, so using, um, if you're doing NPVs or IRRs, you need to use the cash flow function. So let's just have a look at that. OK, now, if you've got a series of uneven cash flows. So we're not looking at an annuity where the cash flow is the same each year. Um, you might need to work out the present value of those cash flows. Some could be positive, some could be negative. Here they tell you your discount factor is 6% and in the data it tells you that you have an outflow at T0, a cost of $1,000 on some projects or investment, whatever it might be. In the uh, year one, end of year one, you then receive 700. End of year two, um, you receive 800. End of year three, 900. And end of year four, 900. Um, first of all, we need to enter this information into our calculator. So if, if you stay where you are, I'll just um, go back and find a calculator. Okay, so buttons that we'll be using. There is a cash flow button next to the um, second button. So we'll use that to enter the data. I'll then refer you to the NPV button to calculate NPVs and the IRR button to calculate internal rates of return. So the cash flow button is the one that we need to look at first. Okay, so if you push your cash flow button, it should be um, CF0 is the first thing that you see. Now, if you've got data in there, you need to clear it. So second CE will clear that data. In CF0, you want to put in minus 1,000. So 1,000, hit the minus button at the bottom and then enter it. And you should see a little equals pop up by the CFO, a little equals pops up there to say that it's been entered. If you scroll down, you then get cash flow at time one. We want 700 to go in there. And again, enter it and you'll see the little equals. If you scroll down again, you get something called F01 um, and that's the frequency of the cash flow. Well, 700 is just going in uh, once. Um, you then got CO2. We're gonna put 800 in there. So again, enter, scroll down, F2, again, we can just leave as one. Um, CO3, we're going to put 9,000 in there. And then the frequency of that, we can say, happens twice. Or you could just ignore the frequencies and just do cash flow 0 minus 1,000, cash flow 1, 700, skip over the, the Fs. Cash flow 2, 800, cash flow 3, 900, cash flow 4, 900. You don't have to use the frequency buttons. Okay, if you just scroll through, just make sure that everything has entered. Um, in other words, you have got the equals that you need. Twice. Okay, right, so all the data is now entered. Um, so that's your cash flow button. The button next to that is the NPV button. So push that and it asks you for an interest rate. The interest rate was six, so you want to do six enter and then scroll down again. It now says NPV equals zero. What you need to do is to compute it. So up to the compute button 
and you get an NPV of 1,840. Um, if you do the IRR, um, you can push the IRR button and compute, and you get an IRR of 68. 0.24%. Now, the IRR, um, if you've come across it, remember, is the discount rate for a set of cash flows, which gives those cash flows a net present value of zero. Okay, so um, a little calculation for you to work through. There are two projects, A and B. Initial investment at time one, and then some inflows coming in over the following three years. Um, could you calculate the NPV and the IRR of both of these, assuming a cost of capital of 10? Now, you've got the information there. Um, it's just a case of working through the calculator. So we'll just spend some time working through it. Any questions, let me know. So second, nope, sorry, not second, rather cash flow. Uh, we need to clear it. So second CE, enter the cash flows for project A, remembering to enter each one of them. Once you've entered them, go into NPV, enter your interest rate, scroll down and compute the net present value, which is about 242. The IRR button, push that and compute about 18%. Okay, so have a go at the next one. Remember to clear your cash flows, second CE. Okay, enter your NPV as 10% interest rate. Compute the NPV, yep, you get 342 thereabouts. IRR, compute. 20%. So really useful function in the exam. Okay. Right. Um, last thing we're going to look at is standard deviation. Okay, so um, with standard deviation, if you need to work out statistics on a population um, or a sample, then first of all, there are, there are two elements to the calculator. There's data entry and then there's analysis. So if I just go back to a calculator, if I can show you what we need. So here we go. Okay, if you look um, above the button for seven, it says data. So we could do second seven, and it allows us to input data. And then once the data has been input, if you look above the eight, it says stat, as in statistical analysis. So second seven would enter the data, and then second eight would then be, uh, allow us to do some sort of statistical analysis. Okay, so here we have um, a sample, population, whatever it might be. We want to enter it, so we go second seven, and that gives you um, X01. Again, if you've got data in there, second CE to clear it. Now in X01, I'm gonna enter my data as it's given to me, so as a decimal or a percentage, however it's given. Um, scroll down and you get Y01. Um, Y01 is frequency. Now, frequency for the Ys, um, the way that you might be examined on this is probability. They might tell you there's a 20% a chance that you get a 30% return, for example. Now, that's not the case in this example. We'll see that in a second. So for this example, you can basically ignore all the Ys. So you want to put in 30% in X1, 12% in X2, and, and so on. So let's just do that. So we're in X1, let's type in 30, enter. We then go down to Y1, we can skip the Ys. X2, 12, enter. Skip the Ys. X3, 25, enter. X4, skip the Ys, is 20, enter. And X5, 23, enter. So our data has now been entered and we can clear out. So CE, clear the work and the data is in there. 
For the analysis, we need to do second eight. And I'm looking at something called one minus V. So you need to be in that mode. Remember, second and then just up from second, enter, switches you between. So you might be in lin or ln or exp or power. Um, scroll through them all. What you want to be is in 1v. So you want 1v. Um, and again, once you've done this once, it, it, it stays like this. And you wouldn't be in any other um, mode for level 1. It means one variable. OK, so we're in 1v. Let's scroll down. Um, N is giving us five. So we entered five items of data. Scroll down again. X bar is the, the average. So the average of these returns, whatever they were, is 22. Scroll down again. You get SX. This is the uh, standard deviation of a sample. So if you're assuming the data is a sample, then that would be the number you'd want. Scroll down again. Uh, you get 5.967, um, and that would be the standard deviation if you were actually looking at an entire population. Um, they might ask you for a variance, so let's do the variance of the population. We've got 5.966 in our calculator. Just hit the squared button, which is underneath the PV button, or two buttons above eight, and it squares it for you, so 35.6. OK, right. Very last thing to look at then is thinking about standard deviation, but in the context of probability. Um, so this is where um, probabilities get assigned to a particular outcome. So in this situation, let's say we're talking about share price. Share price could be unfavorable or I guess return, I should say. The return on the share could be unfavorable. The yield could be bad. Um, the yield could be OK, um, or the yield could be good. So a bad yield is a yield of 3%. An OK yield is a yield of 8 And a good yield is a yield of 14%. Now, let's assume that if the oil price goes up, results are going to be bad. And there is a 20% chance that that will be the case. So we're bringing in probability. If the oil price stays the same, things are OK. And there's a 30% chance of that happening. And if the price of oil goes down, that's great. We think our results will pick up. Um, and there's a 50% likelihood of that. Now, you can work it all through as the um, slide is done. But there's no point in doing it longhand when you've got the calculator in the exam. So let's just think about how we would do this. OK, first of all, we want to do our data input. So that's second seven. Um, that gives us our x1. We want to input. Actually, let's clear it because it's, it's all in there from before. So let's, let's clear that. Um, we've got a 3%, 8%, and 14% Okay, return. So x1, the data itself, is 3%. If you then scroll down, so we're going to enter three, scroll down, y1 is the probability of that bad situation happening. And there was a 20% chance um, that the results wouldn't be very good. Be careful here. You need to enter it as a percentage, not a decimal. So don't put in 0.2. It won't work. You need to put in 20. Whatever you put in the x's doesn't matter. But for the y's, the format must be as a percentage. OK, so let's enter 20%. Enter. Scroll down, we get x2. That's if the oil price is OK. Um, in that situation, results are 8%. And so let's enter 8. Scroll down. The probability of that happening is 30%. So 30, enter. Scroll down again, x3. So good results would be 14%. And Y3, the probability of that happening is 50%. Okay. So um, just scroll up and down to make sure all your data is right. And what you need is to see those equals to ensure that the, data, da sorry, the, the data has actually been entered. So just be happy that all that's in there. 
OK, um, once you've entered the data, you're happy with that, you can see clear out. We're then going to do second eight to do our statistical analysis. The reading should be 1V because you put it into that already. Um, if you scroll down, it tells you that N is 100 because we've entered every situation. There was a 20% um, that the market did badly. 30% the market was okay, and a 50% chance the market did well. So we've covered every eventuality, so there's 100% in there. Um, scroll down again, it gives you an average, a mean of 10. And then scroll down again, not to the SX, you want to scroll down to the standard deviation. Here we want to make sure we're using the population. Um, and the reason we want population and not sample is because we have covered every eventuality. So we're looking at all data, the full set of data. So again, be careful here. Make sure that when you do read off the calculator, you pick up the standard deviation of the population here when you're using probabilities. Okay. Excellent. OK, so that's um, about an hour. Um, that's the, the sort of intro to the calculator. Yes, there are other functions um, that the calculator can do, but those are the key ones that really come up in the exam. Um, in terms of exam preparation, remember, um, there are full classroom courses that you can come on in addition to the online learning. And there are uh, great revision courses as well, which offer a series of uh, mocks and review courses, which help you go over what you need to do. Um, cognition that we offer, again, is our online study um, questions which basically get tailored to you. So you know, as you're practicing the calculator and you're going through the questions, what Cognition will do is if you get lots of, you know, a couple of questions right on a particular area, it won't ask you more on that topic. The areas that you're getting wrong, it will focus there. So it, it's very useful in that you don't have to spend time just number crunching stuff that you can already do. OK, um, now ultimately we've got a mix of classroom um, online, great study material and apps for you to use. Um, again, tutors usually give out, well, do um, give out their email address or their phone number so it can be contactable. And if, obviously, we've got the help desk if you wanted to any sort of email uh, queries as well. So really easy to get your queries answered. Um, and in terms of contacting us, you've got numbers here and emails that can be useful for you. OK, um, I hope you found that useful. The calculator can seem incredibly daunting at the beginning, um, but even with very, I, I think, perhaps little effort from you in terms of sitting down and actually understanding what it's about, just plodding through the questions, you are forced to use it. And getting it wrong or using it wrongly, you know, three or four times is the best way to learn what to do. So don't sort of sit there and read the manual practice questions, get them wrong, and then learn from your mistakes. Definitely the best way for CFA. Um, best of luck in your studies.